Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last day and or half day of Cord Blood Connect. Where is Matt? That was awesome. Thank you so much, Matt, for for doing that and being such a champion of um, cord blood transplant in our field. I just wanted to say a very uh, hearty thank you to everyone who is here and for people who have traveled from far and near. We very much appreciate you being here. To all the exhibitors who have been here, I don't know if anyone's still left, but um, please accept uh, CBA's sincere gratitude for helping us to keep this meeting going um, and all of your sponsorship. So we have an exciting morning and we're gonna have two sessions this morning with a break in between. And I'm going to turn this morning's sessions over to Dr. Amanda Olson, who will be chairing this session. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have kind of a fun scientific lineup this morning, um, and we'll do things a little bit differently. So we'll do the 20 minute talks, and then we'll do 10 minutes for questions after each talk, so that you don't kind of have to remember, okay, what was that first talk during the third? Um, and so hopefully that'll keep the questions fresh. Um, these are the three of us, so two Amandas and a Katie, so easy to, easy to remember. Um, and no disclosures. Okay, and then I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, Amanda Carnardi. Close enough, okay. Executive Director at Arteva Biotherapeutics. Thank you. All right, good morning everyone. So last name Connerty for those who need to know the correct uh, pronunciation. So I'm gonna give a little just kind of overview of what we do at Arteva. Um, using cord blood derived NK cells. I do have one disclosure that is sort of new, but uh, I am an employee of Arteva and a shareholder, so I'll get that out of the way. Um, a little bit about Arteva. We're located in San Diego, California. We've been around about five years, which is fairly new in the biotech space. Um, what we work on is a product called AB101 or Allo NK. Right now, that is a non genetically modified NK cell that we derive from cord blood. And we currently have clinical trials in both oncology and the autoimmune space using our AB101 product. As far as our cleared INDs, um, our first study, AB101-01, was for NHL uh, in combination with rituximab, and we've treated 45 patients on that study. We have another study that is called our O2 study that is um, in a collaboration with a company called Affymed. They're a company based out of Germany that has an NK cell engager. They're in the Hodgkin lymphoma space. That is their IND, but they are using our uh, NK cells for their clinical trial. We have another study that's our O3 study that's fairly new for um, systemic lupus and lupus nephritis with rituximab or obinutuzumab, and we've treated one subject on that study. And then we have another study that's an investigator-initiated trial actually here in Florida. Um, it's a basket study, again, in combination with rituximab in the autoimmune space, and we have treated one patient on that study as well. Um, as far as what do we do, what are we, you know, what are we looking at? Again, our product is an off-the-shelf, non-genetically modified, cryopreserved NK cell therapy. Again, utilizing cord blood as that starting material. We do have some clinical data. I'll share a high level of that uh, in some upcoming slides. Um, we're in the SLE space now. We've sort of wrapped up our phase one study in the NHL space, and now we're really focused on um, the autoimmune space as are a number of cell therapy companies. Um, we do have plans to ad initiate additional autoimmune indications outside of lupus and lupus nephritis, but our, real, our plan is to just develop safe and effective NK cell therapies that can be utilized in a, in a community setting, you know, a physician's office, an infusion center, and not necessarily at a giant, you know, center of excellence for bone marrow transplant. Um, our product is manufactured at scale, it's off the shelf, it is thought at bedside in an outpatient setting, even, even for our NHL and Hodgkin's patients, that is an outpatient therapy. Um, you know, it's about a five to 10 minute infusion. Um, the actual, the monoclonal antibodies take longer than our actual cell therapy. Um, yeah, so interesting. Um, as far as our approach for sourcing, sourcing the donor material, I think you guys heard me talk the other day about cord blood being a great source and how to work with us. And so right now, our, our source for our cells is cord blood. We have no plans to look at any other cell sources. Um, we have direct agreements with three domestic US banks, and then we also work with Be The Match to source our cord blood units. 
We're currently using FDA license cords, and I think for the reasons that have been described, but we are planning to explore using non-licensed cords. We are gonna have that conversation with the agency, and it's not really for any reason other than let's just ask. You know, the BLA is for oncology, it's for CD34, there's minimum requirements. That's not actually our cell of interest. We're using it off-label anyway. And the non-licensed cords, you know, have the same safety requirements as the licensed cords. So it is a conversation we may have with them just to see what their answer is. Um, as far as, you know, our demographic variability, having the banks, you know, spread around the country and working with Be The Match, it does give us some variability of our donors based on the geography and ethnicity, just as the US is so cosmopolitan, but that isn't actually part of our screening process. We're not looking for certain genders or ethnicities or geographies in our screening. What we do screen for, we do that upfront, and so we work with the banks to either send out segments for the testing or use spot cards um, with a third-party vendor, and the only things we screen for now are a CD16 high affinity, and a Cure B haplotype. So those are tests that are able to be done up front. Um, once we get the results of the testing from those third-party test labs, um, the vendors let us know the cord blood banks will be the match. Hey, we found some units they, that have your criteria. When do you want us to ship those? And so we're able to just procure those units. They're shipped directly to Arteva, and we just put them in the freezer for whenever we want to use them, which is a great thing about cord blood. I'm not trying to schedule around a donor availability or anything like that. I can just build up my inventory of starting material and manufacture based on the schedule that we need to manufacture on. So, you know, one of the important things, I think it's been discussed already, is the consenting of the cord blood donors. You know, depending on when it was collected, uh, the consent could be different. So we do need the units to be consented for commercial use, even though we're in a clinical phase now, because I'm actually generating a master cell bank with these NK cells, I'm not sure that this bank won't be around in five years when I'm, you know, lucky, hopefully lucky enough to commercialize a product. And so I need to make sure that it's properly consented. But again, you know, being able to build this inventory of donors allows me complete control over my manufacturing schedule. And it also allows um, my translational team, because this is a clinical study, and we are tracking our cells once they're in the patient, um, what they do is look at the HLA. We're not looking at, we're not manufacturing or treating based on HLA, but we do use the HLA markers to just track our cells within patients. And so it does allow our translational team to get their assays up and running ahead of time with some material from the cord bloods. So why NK cells? You know, there are a number of cells in there. There's a lot of... Um, studies going on now with CAR-T in the autoimmune space, but I think, you know, most of you are familiar, but I'll go over it anyway. Um, you know, NK cells, it's your first line of defense against tumors or other pathogenic cells. Um, NK cells, when they're activated, release a lot of green enzymes and perforins and secrete cytokines to engage your other cells in your immune system. Um, they work really well with ADCC, which is antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity, which is how we use our cells in combination with monoclonal antibodies. The CD16 that we're screening for on these cells does facilitate that monoclonal antibody engagement with the receptors on those cells, and then it activates them to kill the target cells. But, and unlike T cells, um, these have a, you know, really no risk, if any at all, of alloreactivity or GVHD, which is very important for an off-the-shelf product. So I talked about why NK cells, why cord blood NK cells. I can get NK cells from anywhere, and, and that, that is a true statement. But, you know, what we found in our research is that um, cord blood NK cells in particular have a really high enhanced cytotoxic activity. Um, I'm not going to read all of these words here, but they have a really good activity against tumor cells. Um, they seem to have greater proliferative capacity, and I'll show you how our manufacturing and what scale we are manufacturing with one cord blood unit. Um, we're very happy with, with the outcome. Again, Corblet, it's readily available, it's accessible. Like I said, I can screen ahead of time, build my inventory of cords and have complete control of, you know, my manufacturing. There's some unique cytokine profiles that are inherent in cord blood and Ks. Um, you know, the sourcing is, we consider it very ethical. I think we had a conversation about that earlier this week about the ethics involved in cord blood. And if things are done properly and consented properly, I feel like it's, it's a really, you know, reliable and ethically sourced material. And then there's reduced risk of pathogen transmission. You know, these cells have not been exposed to the, you know, wonders of the world. And so, you know, we feel that they're, you know, on the safer side as far as cell therapies go. And then how do our cells work? Again, um, as part of our protocols, and our protocol uh, treatments right now are the same for an oncology study as they are for our autoimmune study. 
Um, the patients do undergo um, some moderate lymphodepletion prior to receiving our cells in the monoclonal antibody. They then receive the monoclonal antibody, they receive the infusion of our cells, and then, you know, the magic happens with the CD16 interaction and the monoclonal antibody, and then whatever the target cell is. As far as our manufacturing process, this is a very generic high-level uh, <laughs> cartoon of our manufacturing, but again, we start with um, a cord blood unit. Like you all know, it's a 25 mil unit, so I know there's a lot of people like, that's not enough cells to manufacture an off-the-shelf drug. It is a lot enough cells. Um, so again, we're screening for those two attributes. We put those in our inventory. We start off, uh, we do a CD3 depletion on the unit, so we're able to use you know, technologies that exist out there for cell depletions. We deplete those cells and put them into culture with a proprietary feeder cell line that is a T-cell-based feeder cell line. And then we just culture expand those cells for two weeks, and that is enough material to generate our master cell bank. And depending on the size of the unit, we get around 50 to 100 vials of master cell bank that we just cryopreserve and put away for later. And then for our drug product manufacturing, we take one vial of that master cell bank, and then very similar to how we made the master cell bank, it's a culture expansion process. It takes about 11 days with the same feeder cell line that we um, made the master cell bank with. We are at a bioreactor scale, so we start off at a few hundred mils in a culture bag system and then scale that up to a 50 liter bioreactor. Again, 11 day process, and at the end, we end up with around 100 vials of drug product. Um, we, we are freezing those in the aseptic technologies vials. There's a number of ways you can freeze cell therapies. You can do vials or bags. We're, we're on team vial for whatever reason. Um, and so, you know, based on this data, based on our manufacturing and based on our experience, we can get, you know, around a minimum of 4,000 vials of 1 billion NK cells per vial from one cord blood unit. And then, depending on our study, the dosing strategy, where they are in the clinical protocol, you know, we can treat hundreds if not thousands of patients for these doses. Um, I'll go over here just a little bit of, again, high-level safety data from our um, 45 patient non-Hodgkin lymphoma study. Again, we completed this study late last year. Um, this is a different pa patient population, you can imagine, from an autoimmune space. These, these patients, you know, it's four prior lines of therapy because this was a novel indication or novel therapy. You know, it, we're never going to be first line in this setting. Um, and, and it tends to be an older population than you t tend to see with the autoimmune patients. But what this is just demonstrating is of these 45 patients, again, this cell therapy, the chemotherapy preconditioning, the administration of the monoclonal antibody and the cell therapy cells was all done in an outpatient setting, but there were some incidents of hospitalization, mostly due to infections and fevers, but that only occurred at about 31% of this patient population. And you can see here a lot of our patients were in their 60s and 70s, again, four prior lines of therapy, but overall, um, the safety profile from the uh, AB101 drug was, was fairly great, good in this setting. So as far as a cell therapy, how does it work in the autoimmune space? Um, again, a lot of the cell therapies out there that are exploring this are CAR T, so it's an autologous product. It's genetically modified with the CAR, typically to a CD19. Um, <clears throat> because that was so successful in the oncology space, you know, the next logical step when people started seeing the papers that came out of all the labs doing these studies that, uh, hey, why not try this out in the autoimmune space? Um, and what they've seen is that you do get that deep B cell depletion, which is the mechanism of an autoimmune disease. Um, and so, you know, it made sense to move on with this. So it was tested in a, a small number of patients, and they did see some therapeutic evidence. Um, you know, but with any CAR T, this involves an apheresis, it involves, you know, hospitalization for a minimum of 10 days, and then there are some, you know, risks with cytokine release syndrome in this setting with CAR T. <coughs> So again, very high level. This is just some overview of our preclinical data. You can see that, you know, with our AB101 product, we also saw that very deep B cell depletion. Um, and so we felt like the next logical step for, you know, in our path to a community-based setting was to try ourselves in this uh, outpatient setting with autoimmune patients. So like I mentioned, you know, some of the limitations of autocar-T versus potential advantages of our product, again, with, with the autologous car-T, there is a collection 
for the patient. Um, they need to be hospitalized for the treatment. And typically right now, I think these can only be done in centers of excellence that have a transplant lab. They have an apheresis center. So you're, the patients are very limited geographically as to where they can go for these therapies. I um, mean, it is quite a complex manufacturing process. And, you know, as far as the risk, the CRS is a real risk for um, for a CAR-T, and also in the oncology setting, we have seen quite a bit of relapse in that setting. I'm not sure that'll translate to the autoimmune space, but you know, data will tell. But as far as our product, again, this is outpatient, even in the autoimmune space. In our uh, lymphoma population, you saw only about 10% of the patients had CRS, and even that was about a 15-minute fever. And there's no apheresis, there's no patient-specific manufacturing, and this can be shipped to any infusion center. Um, you know, to be delivered at, just like any other medication. I think it came up in one of the conversations just about working with pharmacies. There's a lot of places now that are sending cell therapies to their investigational pharmacy or to an infusion center. And so it, it is a new um, sort of use of this drug, and we're kind of navigating that with these centers who've never touched a cell therapy or don't never touch anything frozen. How do we thaw this? How do we give it? So that's part of what we're doing is educating our clinical sites because we do want this to be available to patients everywhere and it is possible. And so setting up that framework to train all of these centers that may have never heard of a cell therapy or touched it or looked at it at all um, is something really important to us and we feel like we can do that. And so we're working with the agency on that. I think I mentioned in a conversation yesterday that one of the feedbacks we got on our IND was that our you know, for the first few patients, we needed to infuse these cells at a fact-accredited site, which is great. Um, but in the autoimmune space, you're working with rheumatologists and nephrologists. They don't necessarily play nicely together with transplant doctors or even know the transplant doctors. So stating that you need to infuse this at a fact center, you can look at that on paper, but the clinics are not the same. They're not going to be, you know, working in the same spaces. And a lot of times what we found is some of the centers now are saying they will only work, you know, cell therapy labs and the apheresis groups, which don't really apply to us, but they've said they're only going to work to support oncology settings, uh, clinical trials, and some of them will only work on hemonc uh, clinical trials. And so even though we may go to these centers of excellence that are fact accredited, none of their uh, oncology cell therapy clinics want to work with us because it's not an oncology clinical trial. So it, it, it seems a little moot to me. Again, it's just one of our, our challenges at the moment that we're working on. So we're just going to gather data and go back to the agency and say, hey, it's safe. We can do this outside of a cell therapy lab. So just overall conclusions um, for us, cord blood is a readily available donor cell material. We can screen it up front, build up our inventory, and have 100% control over our manufacturing schedule. You know, it really can be processed in a number of ways. You know, I've demonstrated how I'm using it. There are a lot of different cells in a cord blood that you can use to manufacture a variety of cell therapies, a CAR-T, a CD34-derived product. Um, and again, it allows for greater control over your development and your manufacturing timeline to, you know, get these therapies out to patients. So that's all I had. So I'll stand here and take any questions anybody has. <laughs> Thank you, Mitch Horowitz from Duke. Uh, I, I guess I'm, this first I've heard of your company, really interesting work. Can, I, can you explain to me what is the uh, IP? What is the proprietary product? I, I, your expansion is incredible, so I'm assuming the feeder line, as you mentioned, is the monoclonal antibody proprietary as well? It's not. It's it's you know it's just rituximab, so that's I not see. even ours. So yeah, we're okay. just using what's already out there in, in you know, in use in the clinic. We're not looking for really, the only novel um, engager that we're using is the one from Afimed that is part, that is their clinical trial, so that's not commercially available. But for our other studies, we intend to use things that are already commercially available. I see. So the, 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 the lymphodepletion, the B cell depletion that you're seeing, presumably that's far and away more than you'd get with just giving rituximab by itself. Yes. So yeah, all of our preclinical data, we've demonstrated it, you know, obviously in, a, in an in vitro model, B cell depletion with rituximab alone, and then also with just our NK cells, and then in combination. So the difference between the two is quite striking in, in an in vitro model. Thank you. Sure. Hi, and Hi. thanks for a great talk. Um, I have a few questions. Sure. Um, have you treated patients who failed rituximab? Who and failed rituximab? To, right. In our uh, lymphoma study, yes. So some of the patients that we treated had been on rituximab before without success, and some of them were also post-CAR-T. Okay. Yeah. 
Um, and your proprietary cell line, or I'm assuming that's proprietary, the one you use for the feeder, feeder cell, cell line. Yes. Yeah. Is that irradiated? Yes, it isn't irradiated. It's just a T cell line that's engineered with the markers that most people's uh, T cell or feeder lines are engineered with. So yes. And how are they engineered? I'm sorry. How are they engineered? Oh, oh. Uh, it, with vectors, yes. So the uh, the research bank that was generated with those cells, it's an EHUD 78 cell, it's not a secret, but um, they're engineered with viral vectors and then uh, culture expanded into a master cell bank and a working cell bank and then we utilize those banks to make in-use feeders that are irradiated for use in our process. Um, and do you guys offer an expanded access program? <sighs> <laughs> We would love to. So it is something we're talking about to try to get this out to more people. But like I mentioned, we're having some, I don't want to say challenges, that sounds negative, but some interactions with the agency that are uh, prohibiting us to do that at this point. But it is something we're considering, yes. OK, great. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, I have a few questions, but I'll sure. just pick like two. So, so have you looked at plasma cell depletion in the recipients? Yes. So um, because we're so early in our patient population with a, the uh, autoimmune space, we have a little bit of data coming in on that. But, but uh, our team has been looking at that in the NHL patients, so I, I don't have that data with me. Yes, but that is something we're looking at. We, our um, you know, post-infusion uh, profile of things that we're looking at is quite extensive, and it does include plasma cells. Uh -huh. And then since your feeder layer is this clonal uh, T-cell blaster, how does that impact licensing and then how does that, like how do you predict that would play in different patients that you're treating? So if I understood your question, yes. How does the feeder cell line impact the licensing? Yeah, like are the NK cells licensed in culture and does that impact their efficacy? Oh, lice, depending the, cell, on lice the feeder cells. Licensing of the N NK cells. <laughs> licensing of the NK cells. Um, I. I don't, I'm not sure I understand your question, but those are our, I guess, our NK cells. So I don't, I'm not really licensing them. Does that mean? No, no. The, the, uh, like the biology of the NK are the NK cells licensed by the feeder cells. Oh, oh yeah. sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, they're just activating the T, the NK cells. So all they do is drive that culture expansion. Uh -huh. So we we add the T cells on you know day one of our culture expansion process, and those are 100% gone by day five of the two week master cell bank process and day five of the um, drug product manufacturing. And so all they're doing is stimulating the NK cells to divide, and it's really based on the engineering markers. It's like a 4-1 BB and a, uh -huh. you know. But it's not, it's independent of class one on the feeder cells? Yes, uh -huh. yes. I just, I had a couple oh, sure. as well. Okay, um, so the one disease that's been treated on the basket study, you mentioned, what was it? Like, what indications are you kind of looking at? That's so, what I'm sure. curious about. So on um, our own study that we're, we're intending to expand that to other indications as well, it's lupus nephritis and uh, systemic lupus. On the basket study, that study includes um, vasculitis. Um, it, it also includes lupus nephritis, um, pemphigus vulgaris, and there's one other indication. I believe they're looking at rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. And then the lymphodepletion mm -hmm. that you're using is just standard. It, it's it's it is standard, but it's less intense than what you would do. It's obviously, reduced. for a my it's yes. not myeloablative. Yes. Okay. This is, you said all done outpatient yes. for these patients? And it looked like you showed about eight patients. Was that, is that right, that were re-hospitalized? Uh, here, yeah, I can go back to that slide. Ish. Sure. That was my, like, ballpark. I didn't count. Uh, so, yeah, so it was actually 14 of our 31 patients. These were just the ones that were hospitalized for the longest. Okay. Um, you know. So about half are re are hospitalized at some um, point. It's about, you know, 14 out of 45, so. 45. Yeah. I thought 40. you said 31. Oh, no. Okay. No worries. Okay. Um, maybe age is a predictor? It, it could be a predictor. Um, you know, some of these things here, it was upper respiratory infections, flu. It is that population. It does depend on the time of year. Um, as far as our evaluation and safety, none of the uh, hospitalizations were attributed to our drug or even the treatment at all. Um, it was just the Bad. course of things. Yeah. Some of it was caution as well. I know for the one patient here, 
If you look at patient 34, he was a 70-year-old who was in there for 12 days. Um, it was one of those things where they, it was like a precaution where the patient was elderly and, ten, and lived far and away. And flu. Yeah, yeah, they had flu, and they're like, you know what, let's just keep you here and make sure that you're better before we send you home. I think this patient didn't have a caregiver um, to, to help with that, and so uh, overabundance of caution, and we appreciated that as well. We'd hate for something to happen. Is there so. a thought to um, hospitalize up front for patients who are maybe over 70? Um, we didn't think of that initially. I mean, again, our intent is for this to be sure. uh, an outpatient study. I will say, though, for the uh, autoimmune trial, because this is a novel use of a cell therapy, the agency did ask us to hospitalize, especially in the basket study, the first patient from each treatment cohort as an observation for 24 hours just in case. So we've got the, the one out of the way. Um, and so we do intend to go with them, you know, with that data and then pull that, so... Any well, other questions? This has been a really nice talk. Oh, thank, yeah, you. thank you. Congratulations. Yeah, thanks. Anybody else have any questions before we move on? Okay, great. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go fast. Let's say, oops, that one's yours. Hang on. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to take you through kind of a whirlwind tour, cornucopia, of all the things we're doing at Anderson right now with mesenchymal stem cells and MSC exosomes. And you're gonna, um, I'll share the slides with you afterwards because there's not enough time to digest all the information that's on the slides. I'm gonna move kind of quick. So we're gonna go through like 10 indications in the next 20 minutes. And you guys got your coffee. You can sprint through this with me, right? Okay, let's do it. Cause it's a lot of fun and I didn't wanna leave anything out. I was thinking about this talk, like what, can I leave out? And there really is nothing that I wanted to. Hopefully I don't have to explain MSCs to this group. I think you guys are pretty well versed, but we're using them for graft versus host disease, regenerative medicine, gene delivery, and they're uniquely sort of um, good for this because there are immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory properties in particular. Also probably don't have to go over this slide too much for this group. So bone marrow derived MSCs have been used in many of the studies. And I think this is where we run into trouble in the MSC literature. Um, there are adipose derived MSCs, there are bone marrow derived MSCs. The quality control is maybe not there as much. Um, and then we know, of course, with the donors, there's a decline in the differentiation potential with increasing age of the donor. Um, the core tissue MSC is totally non-invasive. It's a waste product, obviously, and it can expand to higher numbers, and it doesn't wear out in, in multiple passages. So I can sh show that data in a minute, but there's really a lot of advantages to using the cord, not the least of which is that they're more active than the older, older patient MSCs. Um, we are lucky to have MD Anderson's Cord Blood Bank, and uh, around 30,000 of those now have been used for research. Um, this is kind of goes over the GMP manufacturer of cord blood-derived MSCs. Um, and then at the bottom, you'll see a comparison of the marrow MSCs versus the cord tissue MSCs. So what I'm trying to show you here is that the doubling time is faster for cord tissue MSCs. You get almost a double in the number. And so that's less time for processing, less time for uh, it's lower cost, and of course, less risk for contamination. So um, we are really excited about the about the prospect of using MSCs that are cord tissue derived rather than sort of moving away from the bone marrow derived MSCs. We first looked at MSCs for steroid refractory graft versus hostis, I think even before I was at Anderson, the OSIRIS data um, looked really good in the pediatric population 
um, graft vers steroid refractory graft versus host disease, just for those of you who don't know, is really devastating for our transplant patients. Um, less common now with the advent of rexolitinib and other, uh, other newer drugs, um, but patients can develop graft versus host disease, high grade graft versus host disease, and most of the time it's fatal if they don't respond to steroids pretty quickly. Um, and so the MSC is home to sites of injury, aid in tissue repair, and they're immunoregulatory. We looked first at bone marrow-derived MSCs and graft-versus-host disease, and this is the OSIRIS data. There's a benefit in the pediatric population. This is older data now. Um, but now we're looking sort of the new generation is using uh, the core tissue MSCs. So when we compare the biology of both populations, they have similar, similar marker expression. But we found that cord blood expresses higher levels of transcription factors and markers associated with pluripotency and regeneration. So you can see all of that there. So just a bit stronger. And this is very cool to me. So they really maintain their potency at the later passages. So you can see the bone marrow ones kind of wear out with subsequent passages. Um, but uh, no significant differences were observed in control of the T-cell population between passage three and passage five in the cord tissue. So this is really kind of exciting data. And this is all done by um, Dr. Mayela Ment in our GMP lab, who's wonderful and brilliant. These are also homing studies by de done by Dr. Ment that show when you compare cord tissue to the bone marrow MSCs, they home better in the xenograft graft versus host disease model. And there's a higher persistence over the course of 72 hours, and also sort of a slightly better biodistribution as shown. Cryopreserved cord tissue is therefore a clinical product that works well and treatment with clinical grade cord tissue MSCs produces increased survival and lower graft versus host disease in the mouse xenograft model. So this brings us to our translational stuff. So based on the preclinical data I just showed you, we have a currently accruing study of cord blood MSCs for acute graft versus host disease. Um, Parto Cabaret is the PI for the current phase two, and there's correlatives in the Resvani and Jink laboratory that are ongoing well. Um, and uh, this is a randomized study. So if you look at the, at the study schema at the bottom, so patients are randomized to Jacophy alone versus Jacophy plus MSCs at a lower dose versus Jacophy plus MSCs at the higher dose. And this is currently accruing. But I would like to show you our preliminary data. So 13 patients with steroid refractory GIGVH have been enrolled to date. Seven evaluable patients treated both MSCs plus Rexo have a 100% response rate, which is almost unheard of in this population, honestly. And at MD Anderson, I feel like we really are sort of on it and start the Jacoby quite early. So, um, you know, it's it's been remarkable to have added that MSC has actually had a recent cord blood transplant recipient that high suspicion for graft versus host disease and so put him on this trial and he got Ruxo alone and we were all kind of like no no we wanted the MSCs but um, four treated with Ruxo alone only one had a CR at day 28. <clears throat> so the study continues enrollment but we're really enthusiastic about these results I mean this is this is pretty cool. Now we're gonna shift and we're gonna go to regenerative medicine. So this is where I'm asking you to kind of be a little bit malleable with me because I'm gonna go to different indications. We'll talk about pneumonia first. So large cause of morbidity, mortality for our cancer patients, death rates up to 75% and cord blood MSCs might control the CRS and inflammation associated with the development and progression from pneumonia to ARDS and there's some good data out there to show the mechanism of this. MSCs are not new to ARDS, so they've been used in this space previously, but as I said, the problem with a lot of these MSC studies is quality, um, and uh, they're not comparable with each other. The dosing has been, has been very different, so we re really need to come up with sort of a standard dosing. We even had a study at MD Anderson that we showed safety in for four patients, um, but there was sort of a renewed interest in um, early COVID when we were seeing a lot of ARDS. So we reopened the study 
Um, and it's a pilot of 20 patients followed by a 50 patient randomized portion of MSTs versus standard of care for ARDS. We've now amended the study to include um, pneumonia as well based on the Joshua Hare out of the University of Miami data um, showing that early intervention is better. And we should have probably come to that on our own, but it was nice for somebody to show it as well. So you can see this is our pilot pilot portion. This is super crowded slides, so no worries on even kind of looking through it. But we did so sh show safety, but results were kind of underwhelming, um, which is why we've pivoted now to using pneumonia as well. So patients on just two liters of oxygen are now eligible for the randomized portion of the trial. Um, so we allow for earlier enrollment, and now we're also doing the cytokine panels. Um, and we're enthusiastic about, we've enrolled, subsequently enrolled about five more patients and are pretty enthusiastic about the results. It, it does seem that earlier intervention obviously is better. Um, once they're to ARDS, there's a lot of fibrosis um, and I'm not sure our little MSCs can, can do the job. Um, so MSGs show promise, um, but we're excited to use cord MSCs because we think that they'll behave better than the bone marrow derived MSCs. Um, the cool thing about it is for lung, IV administration is comparable to IT since the first pass of any cellular therapy that we give is to the lung. So in this case, it really works out for us. Um, and there's definitely safety, and then we've amended the study. Um, okay, we're shifting again. So everybody get your brains ready. We're gonna go to cardiomyopathy. So anthracycline cardiomyopathy. Um, and this MSC trial is in collaboration with Texas Heart Institute. Um, just a, a brief little tidbit uh, background on anthracycline cardiomyopathy. So it's sort of terrible because it can happen 20 years after patients receive chemotherapy. And now that we have a lot of both breast cancer and lymphoma survivors, this population is increasing. And having seen this patient, these patients, heart failure is re really affects quality of life in general. Um, and so, I think you know, I feel a certain responsibility to our um, cancer survivors now uh, to do a to do something novel for them. Um, there are several mechanisms by which MSCs sort of aid in the functional repair of the heart via paracrine signaling, extracellular matrix remodeling, and immunoregulation. And this is sort of the natural history of these patients. So half of the patients will respond to the standard sort of the therapy that hasn't changed, I don't think since the 80s or 90s, um, beta blocker ACE inhibitor diuretic. But then half of the patients will go on to need an LVAD or even a heart transplant, um, and their quality of life is, is sort of terrible. Um, this is a previous phase two dose escalation study of MSCs, um, and this is the Myostar catheter, so it's uh, based on electromechanical electromagnetic mapping. And so what the cardiologist at Texas, I don't do the injections into the heart because I'm a hemonc person, so that would not be good. But Emerson Perrin, who's the head of Texas Heart, is well versed in doing this. So it creates this map of the heart and it tells you areas of dysfunction. And then they inject directly into areas of dysfunction, which is very cool, but only available at certain centers um, and requires a lot of expertise. So that's sort of the limitation for that. <clears throat> In a previous study with mesoblast, um, they showed reverse revo remodeling that was dose dependent. So because it took so long, as you would imagine, to um, have IRB approval at both Texas Heart Institute and at MD Anderson, we started a trial, IV versus standard of care alone, and then once Texas Heart was sort of up and running, now we have a three-arm trial, which is transendocardial versus IV versus standard of care, which is that three drugs. So everybody gets the three drugs. We have a, a new little enthusiastic cardiologist that helps me make sure that I understand all the cardiology drugs that they need to be on prior to coming. We make sure they're optimized. Um, and we randomize to, to those three arms now. This is, a, again, a crowded slide, but I kind of wanted to highlight there's clinical improvement and decreases in biomarkers. We're seeing in all the patients. 
um, but here, it's, sum it's summarized here. Decreased, uh, increase in ejection fraction in five of the six IV and one of the three intracardiac MSC recipients, which I think is sort of remarkable. And in these patients, truly having taken care of them, like they're coming to clinic, they're short of breath, they can't even get from one side of, I mean, Anderson's big, right? But they can't get from one side of Anderson to the other without having somebody roll them in a wheelchair. And then after their ejection fraction is better, they're doing, you know, they're telling me their favorite sort of Peloton instructor. So, and it really makes a huge difference in their, in their quality of life. So these aren't just numbers for ejection fraction. These are actually really palpable changes um, in quality of life for these patients. And it's so interesting to me that the IV seems to work better than the intracardiac. So our cardiology friends are not super happy. Um, these are small numbers, so we can't draw any major <laughs> conclusions. Um, but I think that maybe the biodistribution is a little bit better if the heart sort of bathed, right, in the MSCs versus they're just seeing areas that are dysfunctional and maybe they're injecting scar tissue. I, I brought these issues up. But, um, but they do have the fancy catheter delivery system. But I'm kind of happy that the IV works a little bit better because anybody can do the IV versus these tiny little centers or these big centers that are very few and far between that can do the transendocardial injections in a safe manner. Um, so that this study is ongoing. And then I'm going to switch over and talk about brain cancer now. So everybody's still with me. We're sprinting through it all. Good job. Y'all are doing great. Hang in there. Okay, so this is uh, MSCs for gene delivery. So glioblastoma, terrible, terrible cancer, dismal survival at recurrence. And so we're collaborating with Fred Lang now. Um, to So we have um, Delta 24 RGD is an oncolytic virus that activates tumor-specific anti-gliomal immune response. I have to always get help for my notes with that one. And we've seen durable responses in a handful of patients who would really, without this therapy, not have been expected to live more than eight or nine months. Um, and so some responses are, are durable, which is sort of magical in the, the area of glioblastoma because this is a d really devastating disease. <clears throat> this just goes through the manufacture of the MSCs. Um, they're trypsinized, reseeded, and then infected um, with the Delta 24 RGD, and then they're intra arterially infused. MSCs then home to the site of tumor and release the virus, which infect and then destroy the gliomal cells. So um, we thaw and expand passage three. And sort of the next frontier is this endovascular selective intraarterial infusion of MSCs. This is why I love MSCs so much, because I feel like I get to learn about all these crazy things that other people in oncology are doing. Um, and so my, my attention deficit is really, is really fed by this. Um, so intravascular selective intraarterial infusion. So they basically they take an MRI and they fuse it to this cone beam CT and they select the optimal vessel to use to get it to the tumor. So Fred Lang is doing this now and it's very, very interesting. Um, the approach is uh, femoral uh, to internal carotid. And we're currently enrolling on the fifth dose level and expect to complete the study soon. Of the 12 patients, five have survived more than one year. Two patients have survived more than two years, which, as I said, in this disease is, is pretty cool. Um, and then the post-treatment surgical specimens, so these are in the autopsy specimens, um, massive infiltration, dramatic increase of CD8 T cells, and increase in polyfunctional T cells in the blood as well. <clears throat> okay, we're switching over now to exosomes, but we're staying on brain cancer for the rest of the time, just so you know what to expect. I'd like to know what to expect as well. Um, so MSCs are a little bit limited, right, to migrate to target tissues. We all know that. A lot of them get stuck in the lungs. Even if we go through this selective intra-arterial approach, we're a little bit worried about delivery. Um, and so exosomes naturally carry RNA between cells. The hypothesis is they may be useful in gene delivery um, and delivering short interfering RNA or microRNA to tumor targets. 
I lied. We're going to talk about pancreatic cancer for a second, but then we're going back to brain cancer. The treatment of pancreatic cell lines with engineered fibroblast exosomes with the ability to target KRAS reduces tumor volume and increases survival in the mouse model. Um, and this is an overview of the GMP manufacture of the exosomes derived from marrow MSCs. We're going to go to core tissue MSCs in two seconds. We expand MSCs, pull them in the conditioned media, purify the exosomes, resuspend and load the MSCs with siRNA, targeting the oncogenic KRAS via electroporation. And when we compare fibroblasts and MSC-derived exosomes, the exosomes produce higher level. Uh, production is level is higher with MSCs. They're stable when you freeze them and thaw them. That's all this shows, pretty much. <clears throat> and this uh, Kaplan-Meier curve indicates survival after tumor induction of mice with uh, the KRAS, or th uh, the, sorry, the pancreatic tumors. Um, the reported findings lay the foundation for a clinically feasible approach for eye exosome therapy targeting oncogenic KRAS and other cancer types such as lung and colon cancer. So you can really go crazy with this. And this is our phase one study of exosomal delivery to patients with metastatic KRAS expressing tumors. And the first three patients all received more than five lines of prior therapy. So these are super heavily pretreated patients. Um, and at the first three dose levels, we've seen no adverse events and reduction in KRAS DNA in three patients. And this is the revised sort of accelerated titration, titration design for dose escalation. Okay, back to the brain. Here we go. Our next logical step was to look at cord blood MSC exosomes, since we've shown that cord blood is more active than bone marrow. And cord blood exosomes with similar characteristics and phenotype may be more active than bone marrow derived MSCs. This is data, again, from Myella. Functional, so just going back to the glioblastomas, they all have this global assessment of functional decline, and it's largely attributable to all the brain radiation they receive. Um, so cognitive decline is super common in treatment for glioma, 30% global decline on neurocognitive testing in three months. And that's what you see on neurocognitive testing. So these patients are really sort of struggling with cognition as well. Um, cord blood MSC-derived exosomes may mitigate cognitive decline by their involvement in neurorestoration through increased neuro neurogenesis, white matter remodeling, uh, decreasing inflammation, and apoptosis. So we use tests to demonstrate that cognitive decline in mice in the cisplatin-induced model um, there's impairment in executive function, working in spatial memory after cisplatinum administration. And then with either intranasal or IV administration of umbilical cord MSC-derived exosomes, we see a dose-dependent reversal of cognitive impairment. So this is great because then the mice know how to do the little puzzles again. It's actually really rewarding. Um, and the structural changes are seen in the mice, so what plays out clinically for them plays out um, biologically as well. Shown here are the changes in white matter, mitochondria, and synapse density. And so this shows successful biodistribution. You can do it either intranasally for the mice or IV. We would do it um, via the fancy uh, endovascular approach for patients, of course. And we can load MSC-derived exosomes with microRNA. It's shown to have anti-glioma effect against glioma cells via lentivirus. So you can see where I'm going with this. So the microRNA causes cell death via Fox uh, A2 mediated intracellular lipid accumulation. And so it's like a two for one. So two birds, one stone, right? We're mitigating neurotoxicity and we're also eradicating glioma um, with these exosomes, which is a win-win situation. And so that we're sort of set up to do a clinical trial um, now for this. The exosomes can be efficiently loaded uh, with a microRNA via electroporation. It doesn't affect their phenotype or uptake by gliomal cell lines in vitro. And so our next step is to translate this into a clinical trial, and this should be really fun because we'll do neurocognitive testing on the patients as well, um, and it will be really rewarding to be able to show, hey, we can not only help the tumor, but we can also help this horrible neurocognitive decline that happens in the patients, which is really psychologically distressing, as you would imagine. <clears throat> so 
In conclusion, MSCs and MSC-derived exosome products have been proven safe. They're continuing to be evaluated in both regenerative medicine, oncologic spheres, really exciting new trials um, evaluating both of these things sort of simultaneously on the horizon. Um, I'd like to thank my mentors, Katie Rosvani and EJ Spall, Dr. Mayala Mint and her lab uh, for our collaboration, our Cord Blood Bank, GMP, and our grant sponsors, um, none of whom, without any of whom, none of this research would be possible. So thank you for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Everybody's catching their breath. That's okay. Yeah, I knew that was a lot. It was like 66 slides. Y'all did fantastic. I have a question for your cardiac study. Uh, injecting uh, um, MSC IV, because similar experiments with, or treatments of patients were performed decades ago. Yeah, thousands of patients. And the problem with the studies was that the majority of MSC ended up in the lung. And when people try to confirm the data in pig models, in, um, in the mouse, in the rat, using really cardiac models, uh, they were seeing uh, that the cells did not engraft it. Not at all. And um, they were just there at the beginning after four weeks, after eight weeks, and then vanished. Mm -hmm. Because, um, yeah, just a short uh, engraftment, and then they vanished. And the only thing what was observed is was a stimulation uh, from the epicardial zone that when the cells were directly injected to the areas of damage, for instance, as compared to IV, where they stick to the lung, they see some epicardial regeneration. So what is your hypothesis, what you expect to see? Because it's clear that they will not form any kind of cardiomyocytes. Yeah. So is there any animal model where you can prove what you do? Yeah, so we do not have any animal model collaborators, but I'm, sh I'm happy to, and open to talk to anybody who's interested in collaborating. So just to repeat your question so that everybody can hear, yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna make it concise if that's okay. Make, yeah. Stop me if I get it wrong. So the concern is that when we do IV versus direct injection, a lot of the cells are lost. Direct injection has been shown to sort of um, create sites of injury and the MSCs kind of stay there. That's yeah. in, in some kind of what, what, you yeah. said, what you observed. So our model is a little bit different than the decades of research previously, which were done in the congestive heart setting or even the acute MI setting. There's a signal of inflammation following anthracycline induced cardiomyopathy. So this is for a very specific population. Herceptin that doesn't recover, and then anthracycline that doesn't recover. I would love to have an animal model to share with you, but we really we don't we don't have that at current. Um, but the, our cardiologists think that the signal, the paracrine signal for um, immune upregulation, is higher. And in fact, the patient, the one patient who didn't respond to IV MSCs was a patient who had. Hodgkin's lymphoma 20 years prior. And so she probably wasn't having the inflammatory signal. Mm -hmm. The MSCs just got stuck in the lungs and couldn't do anything really to the scar tissue. So I think as long as you treat these patients within a certain window of having received the anthracycline cardiotoxicity, my, my gut is that there's still a signal. And the sooner you treat them, the better. So the patients who are like on active treatment then come to us for three months because their EF drops and they can't get more treatment. We had a breast cancer patient like that. She responded beautifully because she still has this big signal for the MSCs to home to. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very nice talk. Thank you. I have a question about your manufacturing process. One of the sure. Okay. One of the big barriers to use of cord blood derived MSCs is the transition from the use of Genelmax with RUO kits to GMP enzymes in a clinical setting. Are you using RUO dissociation methods or have you developed a cost effective 
GMP enzyme cocktail? I think that Dr. M Dr. Ment is the one. So I'm not in the, I'm just an MD. I'm not a PhD. So okay. not equipped to answer the question, but I'm going to try. So um, Mayela Ment has, has come up with a GMP compliant cocktail in which she has, um, ha has found efficient and effective. But I, I am happy for you to email me or I can email you and talk afterwards and I can put you in touch with her so that she can tell you the details because she is sort of the lab genius behind all of this. Great, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Amanda. <clears throat> I was wondering if you could comment on, excuse me, <clears throat> markers of potency for MSCs in GVHD because even in cord blood, I assume there's a large variation in the, you know, potency or characteristics of the MSCs. So is there any markers where you can select for the appropriate or the most potent MSCs for certain disease states? Um, we have not done that. So we, the question is, are there certain markers that we can select for um, to predict for potency of MSCs or activity of MSCs? So we haven't done that in our lab, but that's something Myela is looking into actually. Okay. Yes, yeah, because we're now entering sort of like the autoimmune space, et cetera, right? So there are all sorts of new indications. So this is a really very interesting question, um, and it's something that we're looking at, but don't have data on yet. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys for sticking with me through that. You did a great job. Let's see. I'm going to get out of this, and then I'm going to introduce our next speaker. Okay, so Kate Brimpolis. Did I do it right this time? Yay! Okay, so she is going to give us a really interesting talk here. Let me see if I can get out of this. Let's see. She's with Devera Therapeutics, um, and... She's going to give us a really interesting talk on generation of monocytes and macrophages from CD34 cord blood cells for cell therapy. So I'm excited to hear this. Do you want me to start the slide deck for you? Here. Here you go. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Brumpless, and as Amanda just said, I'm going to talk to you today about Devera's platform for generating myeloid cell therapies from cord blood units. Here are my disclosures. So first, a quick introduction to the two types of myeloid cells that we are interested in developing, monocytes and macrophages. During regular hematopoiesis, CD34 positive stem cells go through a number of develop developmental stages before they become promonocytes and eventually monocytes, which circulate throughout the bloodstream. And as these monocytes are circulating throughout the bloodstream, they are recruited to tissues and sites of inflammation like tumors, where they then differentiate into macrophages. And macrophages themselves are very highly plastic cells that can quickly change their phenotype and therefore their function in response to environmental cues and other stimuli that they're receiving. So they are experts in phagocytosis, driving inflammation, resolving inflammation, and also coordinating the responses of other immune cells. So these characteristics of monocytes and macrophages make them great candidates to use as cell therapies. So on this slide, I'd like to focus on their plasticity. And so what I'm showing is that you can have a monocyte that can differentiate into these macrophages. And whether it's a monocyte or a macrophage, when it's exposed to different stimuli, on the left hand of the slide, you're seeing the more inflammatory stimuli, so bacterial ligands, LP, like LPS or TLR ligands, interferon gamma. And on the right side, you're seeing the more immunosuppressive cytokines, like IL-10 and TGF-beta, that you might get in a tumor microenvironment. And so, monocytes and macrophages can respond somewhere along this spectrum from pro-inflammation to anti-inflammation. And this can be really useful in labs. So you can precondition these cells or you can genetically engineer these cells 
so that they can affect the phenotype you want as a therapy to support your therapeutic outcomes. And so just very broadly, if you're interested in treating autoimmune or fibrotic diseases, you might want to develop a more anti-inflammatory macrophage. Or if you're interested in developing um, treatments for cancer or infectious diseases, that's where a pro-inflammatory macrophage might come in more use. So at Devera, we are interested in developing monocytes and macrophages for use in the oncology space as a cell therapy for the treatment of solid tumors. So the treatment of solid tumors lags behind that of the treatment of blood cancers. I think we all know this. And with 90% of the expected 2 million new sol cancer cases expected this year, um, that's a large patient population that could potentially benefit from new and innovative therapies. The problem with treating solid tumor cancers is that they display a high level of antigen heterogeneity, so they can be shifting the antigens that they're presenting. The tumor microenvironment itself can be very immunosuppressive and not only shut down immune responses that have already developed, but also inhibit the induction of new immune responses against that tumor. And additionally, getting the therapy into the tumor is complicated. So one of the main downsides that CAR-Ts have for solid tumor treatment is that they physically cannot get into the tumor. So all of these characteristics together lead to the need for frequent interventions with our current standards of care and also some of the um, therapies that are under development, which leads to poor quality of life for patients as well as systemic toxicities. So this is why we're interested in exploring a cell therapy, a macrophage, a monocyte and macrophage cell therapy in particular for treating um, solid tumor cancers. And macrophages themselves are really uniquely positioned to modify the immunosuppressive TME because basically they just like to hang out there. So this is a graphic from a 2008 Pollard review that I really like to show because They've looked at um, the immune infiltrate in the tumor, and what you can see is that the majority of immune cells that are in that tumor are macrophages. And so when you look at the entire tumor cell burden, sometimes you can have upwards of 25% of the cells in that entire tumor are myeloid-derived cells or macrophages. So pulling all of this information together, you have these challenges that the tumor presents shown on the left side of the slide here. And then at Devera, we think that engineered macrophages, or more broadly, engineered monocytes and macrophages can be the solution and overcome some of these challenges. So while um, some groups are, and we are also interested in developing myeloid cells that express chimeric antigen receptors that are tumor-specific due to their innate characteristics, Macrophages can also act in antigen-independent ways, so they'll be less affected by tumor heterogeneity issues. We can also engineer them to express a variety of secreted proteins, such as cytokines or antibodies, that can potentially alter the tumor microenvironment and perhaps prevent, induce, sorry, conversion of uh, cells like tumor-associated macrophages that are already in that TME. Um, as I showed you on the previous slide, macrophages like to be in tumors, so we expect that we would require less frequent admin administration of this treatment. And through engineering, we can engineer in titratable doses and therefore control the amount of treatment that we are getting to the tumor. And through either direct application or engineering and trafficking, we think we can reduce systemic toxicities by having a local delivery. So this is a very broad overview of what we are doing at Devera, and important to our platform, we take cord blood, cord blood units and expand the CD34 positive cells from that, and I'll go into a little bit more detail on the next slide, but on this slide I just wanted to highlight that we use our proprietary notch ligand to expand the CD34 positive cells. And then while I'm obviously focusing on monocytes and macrophages for this talk, um, we do have a number of other cell products that are further advanced and further on in the cell pipeline that 
we can use both the upstream and the downstream processes in the development of those products to inform what and how we are developing the monocyte and macrophage cell therapy product. So as we are expanding and differentiating and creating monocytes and macrophages from CD34 positive cells, we follow a three-phase expansion protocol that um, is shown at the top of the slide, and this slide is to demonstrate how it fits into our standardized cell expansion product process. So we start with um, umbilical cord blood units, and we pool them. And from that pool of cord blood cells, we isolate the CD34 positive cells and expand them with our notch ligand. Once we expand those CD34 positive cells, we can differentiate them into monocytes and further expand them at this stage. And then we can either take these monocytes forward and use them as our product, or differentiate those monocytes into macrophages and use that as our cell therapy product. Uh, what is great about this platform is we have the option to engineer the genome early in phase one or later in phase two, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And we are not currently at this stage with monocytes and macrophages, but the final, um, the final goal is to have an off-the-shelf product at a single dose that we can just thaw at the bedside. So this is getting a little bit into the data. We have spent a fair amount of time optimizing our three-phase process to derive monocytes and macrophages from cord blood units. We have optimized our media formulations, our cytokine combinations, we've looked at different serum replaces, replacements, and we've also um, examined the duration of each culture phase. And with our optimized parameters, if you take a look at the center graph, you can see by the end of phase two, when we have completed monocyte differentiation, that more than 80% of the cells in that culture are our CD14 positive, CD11 B positive monocytes. And by the end of phase three, when we've completed macrophage differentiation, we've increased that number to greater than 90% of the cells in the culture are the macrophages that we are um, interested in. <laughs> so uh, I think really importantly about this platform is it's, it's very scalable. So from a single CD34 positive cell, we can generate up to 200,000 myeloid cells, which gives us hundreds of, hundreds of doses if you're looking at a dose of one billion cells. Um, so we have, we have a lot of capability with a single manufacturing run to produce a lot of doses that can then just go in the freezer until they're needed. So um, our monocytes and macrophages actually look like monocytes and macrophages, which is great. Um, on the left, we're looking at a bulk RNA-seq analysis compared to peripheral blood monocytes. And you can see that they have similar profiles, but our monocytes actually express um, higher levels of some inflammatory, inflammatory genes, which we think is great since we're going after cancer. Um, they also express canonical myeloid markers by flow phenotyping, so CD40, 80, 86, um, all of your basic co-stimulatory markers, they're on monocytes and those are retained and even upregulated on our macrophages. And functionally, they also perform like monocytes and macrophages. So if we take them and put them in culture and challenge with LPS, we get the secretion of IL-6 and TNF in response. Importantly, um, following cryopreservation and thaw, our monocytes retain their viability and their functionality. So here is um, some example data to show you that. On the left, uh, there are both recovery and viability numbers, and while I'm showing you here an average recovery of about 60%, this graph is, is a little old, and I think in a, most of our recent experiments we're getting um, percent recovery rates of up to about 80%, so we have, we have increased this since we've actually done the cryo study. Um, our viability is fairly high across the board, and when you take these thawed cells and then put them into culture, uh, they perform as they did prior to, prior to freeze. So the image that you're seeing here 
all of the red are macrophages that have taken up the bioparticles in culture, and basically they have all phagocytose, the bioparticles that are in culture. And this is um, quantified in the graph on the right. So our macrophages, as expected, take up um, the most amount of bioparticles. Monocytes do fairly well, and this is com in comparison to a phagocytic cell line, THP1s. So something that we're working on right now is how best to engineer these cells. And with our platform, we have a num number of options for when we can engineer them. We can engineer for actual genome modifications early during phase one when, they, when we are expanding the CD34 positive cells. Or we can engineer them later with non-integrating or non-genome editing um, modifications in, during phase two and phase three. And our goal ultimately is to introduce chimeric antigen receptors or cytokines or even antibodies so that we can put these cells you know, into a patient and they will activate immune cells in the suppressive TME and hopefully eradicate that tumor. Um, and while we don't have too much data on this yet to share, I do have some proof of concept data from um, a transduction that we did with a viral vector in phase one on the CD34 positive cells. And this vector encoded uh, an anti-CD19 car. Um, we're all familiar with those. And then um, we put these cells in culture with CD19 positive tumor cells. So the NALM6 line expresses CD19. And if you take a look at these graphs, the triangles represent proliferation of the NALM6 cells when cultured alone. And when in culture with the car expressing monocytes or macrophages, those are the colored circles. You can see that these, these cells effectively um, suppress growth of the tumor cell line. And I have the um, percent transduction levels at the bottom of the slide, and you'll note they're not great. Um, but we are optimizing this. We are improving on this. And I thought it was important to put those numbers up because I think it's still really encouraging. They're relatively low numbers, but we're still getting a lot of control of tumor growth. So I hope that I've shown you that we have this great cell therapy manufacturing platform from which we can generate therapeutically relevant numbers of monocytes and macrophages, and that these cells are phenotypically and functionally active, even following cryopreservation and thaw. And we are currently developing the engineered myeloid cells for use as cell therapy against solid tumors. Um, as I just mentioned, we can engineer them earlier or later, and they're currently exploring both options. So we're working in collaboration with the University of Washington um, using a viral vector-based strategy to express a tumor-specific CAR along with some immune-activating cytokines. And we're also looking at non-viral engineering methods to see um, how we can work with engineering our monocytes and macrophages later down the line. So I'd like to thank um, everyone at Devere. We have a great team there, and without, you know, without our team, none of this would be possible. And I'd specifically like to highlight Jared Putterwitter, who did most of the work that you saw on the slides. So thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, uh, really nice work. Um, <laughs> So I have two quick questions. The first one is more technical. Uh, in the past, when we've tried to pool CD34 cells and expand them together, they don't seem to like being in culture together. Do you ever have that experience also? Because um, that's sort of the starting point um, of, your, of your procedure. Yeah, um, so far, no. Okay. They, I mean, they work well together. We've looked at them. The viability is high. We do get some. Um, we saw some reduction in viability and reduction in proliferation, but that was more driven by different media and cytokine combinations. Um, so far, our pooled CD34s together are quite happy. I mean, they are just selected CD34 positive cells, so we've gotten rid of any of the other cells that are in that mix, but. Um, and then the, the second question was, um, in core blood, there's a decent chunk of these CD14 cells already. 
Um, is there a reason why you start with the CD34s? And sorry if I missed it, you might have said it right at the beginning and I missed it, but um, is there a reason you start with the CD34s and discard that fraction? You can't reuse them? Are they not as, um, do they not have as much longevity or, or what's the, the reason behind that? We can get greater expansion from when we start from the CD34 and the stem and progenitor cells themselves. So it's basically more a streamlined process. We can start with one cell population and expand it a lot more than we can. Like so, by the time we've got into monocytes, the expansion during, oops, sorry, the expansion during the phase two is maybe 20-fold, and that's where we're doing our monocyte differentiation. And so, uh, we're just allowing ourselves for much greater expansion. Great, thanks. I I think you might have just answered my question, but I just <laughs> maybe I missed it. But what is the what role does the notch uh, ligand play in the culture system? I, I thought that notch was more um, designed to retain primitive stemness, and and it's, and instead your 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 goal is to differentiate. Our goal during phase one is to expand our CD34 cells, so we are trying to maintain some of that stemness and immaturity like earlier on, and then once we have that larger pool at the end of phase one, that's when we want to take them and differentiate them into monocytes. Thank you.